I asked my father, does he still fear my death by suicide? The answer was to grab his phone in his pocket and say, Kevin, every time the phone rings, he did not say when I call him. He said when the phone goes off in his pocket, and he's a popular guy, his first and every thought is, Kevin, alive. My actions did that. And I am one who takes responsibility for my actions. My name is Kevin Hines. I jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge. I believed that I had to die, but I lived. Now I help people be here tomorrow. That's own disease. How terrifying is that, parents? Isn't that terrifying? Yes, it's awful. It's running rampant across this country and around the globe. People, young people, a lot of young people who have a lack of resilience, who are not being taught from the age they need to, from the moment they can comprehend what mental health is. They're not being taught how to cope with pain. They're being taught how to enter lots of things into these. And we are losing generations to this device that can do so many wonderful things, but is also doing so many damaging things if it's used in the wrong way. And our children can look at these things and find anything they want, however dangerous to their minds and their souls. I wish I knew that my thoughts did not have to lead me to jump off of that bridge where I would break my back and nearly lose the ability to walk. I know today that no matter how often I think of suicide, I will never die that way. I will always turn to somebody anybody, and I will say four simple but effective words. I need help now. And if I ask you for help, what will you do? Give you hope. Hayden, what will you do? Give you hope. Helen, what will you do? Give you hope. I don't know your name, but it's nice to meet you. What would you do if I asked you for help? I'd give you hope. That's right. You see, my friends, it's not about asking for help once when you're in pain. It's about asking it countless times over and over again until you find someone willing to empathize with it. I will always stay here. Anybody ever tells you Kevin Hines died by suicide? You open an all-out investigation. That was a murder, I promise. Okay? I'm never again going to attempt to do what I did. Because, guys, guess what? I lived. And in living, I got to see the wake of destruction I caused in my path. I get to live with that every day when I look into my family's eyes who are still in pain from what I did. In the filming of Suicide, the Ripple Effect, our movie that, that, that was here recently, I, I, I asked my father if he still feared my death by suicide. We didn't use his response on camera because he didn't want us to, but I recounted it later in the film. I asked my father, does he still fear my death by suicide? His answer was to grab his phone in his pocket and say, Kevin, every time the phone rings, he did not say when I call him, he said, when the phone goes off in his pocket, and he's a popular guy, his first and every thought is, Kevin, alive. My actions did that. And I am one who takes responsibility for my actions. Thus, I'll never again attempt to take my life, not for my father, but because I deserve this life until my natural end, no matter how my distorted, irrational brain sometimes tells me I don't. Those inner critical thoughts, we all have them, don't we? We all have an inner critical voice. That inner critical voice we all have in this room, that voice that tells you you're ugly or stupid or you're less than or you're worse off or you're worthless and you have no value or you're a burden, it is the greatest liar we know. You have value. You are worthy. You do matter. And right here tonight, right in this room, you're important to me and I promise you that. I couldn't see it. At 19 years of age, I sat at my desk in my room. My father was asleep in his. I sat at my desk writing that note. That note that only 20% of civilians who died by suicide actually write. I wrote that note, Mom, I love you, but you're not always right. Dad, I love you, but stop bringing the office home. This isn't work. I said to my little brother who wanted nothing more than to be the greatest DJ on the West Coast, he was making those mixed cassette tapes when they were still hot. <laughs> who in this room still plays mixed cassette tapes? Come on. Yes, it is not dead. I told you, I knew it, you get two, perfect. And his were good, I said, I said to my brother, you'd be a household name in the note. My sister wanted to make films, I said, you got this. 
I said to my girlfriend slash ex-girlfriend, which is debatable depending on who you ask. Anyway, I wrote that note and I said to my best, I said to her, it's not you, it's me, which my wife today would say, no, Kevin, it's always you. But I wrote that note and I said to my best friend, Jake Lewis, arguably the worst part of the entire note. You'll find another best friend. As if that is remotely how it works. I put that note in my shoulder bag, I put that shoulder bag by the door. At six in the morning, I entered my father Patrick's room. Now let's talk about Patrick Kevin Hines. He is no optimist. Patrick Kevin Hines is a pragmatic, pessimistic, and stone-faced man. I see some of you in this room. Pat, no offense, don't get upset. Patrick Hines played 20 years of hockey as the goalie with no mask. Isn't that a bad idea? Anyway, and Patrick Hines was the toughest Sunset Irishman I would ever know besides his uncle, my great uncle, Kevin Joseph Bryan. May he rest in peace. And you see, here's the thing about Patrick and Kevin, who I'm named after, he's named after. Kevin Joseph Ryan is the patriarch of our family, or was. And he was 30 years drunk in his adult life and 30 years sober. In the last 30 years of his life, I would go to his last 10 chips. I would learn how to tell stories as a child in AA watching my uncle. Uncle Kevin had a rough life and a rough past, right? And Uncle Kevin, uh, he was this tough sunset Irishman. Uncle Kevin and my father, Patrick Kevin Hines, had East Coast accents from San Francisco, right? It was awkward, but they were old sunset San Francisco, the toughest men I would ever know, and the toughest on me. Debbie Hines would go home to Pat's house. They were second grade sweethearts. Ask me how that works, I have no idea. They broke up in seventh grade. They were back together in eighth. All my dad ever wanted to do was grow up and raise kids and have a family and love them like he never had. You see, my, my dad's mom and dad had substance use disorder, primary alcoholism. They would die of liver failure, cirrhosis at very young ages, and he would have nothing and no one except his own wits about him to do just that. The Jesuits at USF would give Patrick an education. And he would go on from the governor to become one of those prominent San Francisco economists of his time. From the ground up. And all he ever wanted to do was raise kids that he could give back to like he never had. And Patrick and Deborah Hines, they took in three kids from three separate homes into one and made a melting pot of a family. We didn't look alike in the 1980s and people noticed. Okay? Let me tell you something, right? Me, I'm mixed. You can think of me as everything but Russian. <laughs> or, as our president would say, no, nope, that will offend someone. Never mind. <laughs> you gotta holler at me that joke later, okay? All right, so, so I'm mixed. My brother's black from a different family. My sister's white. Parents are Irish and German. People who stared at us very confused, all right? Women would cross the street to talk to my mom when she walked the three, the three of us. They'd do one of these. They'd do a semicircle around us. like some kind of lion pride. <laughs> they'd lean in like this and they'd do this. <laughs> They'd lean in closer and they'd say, excuse me, best to my mom. And she would say, yes. And they would say, how did all of that happen? <laughs> That's when my mom would very quickly and aptly reply, oh, you know, different fathers. <laughs> <laughs> Which was epic because we all had different fathers. It was true. They didn't know that they ran right back across the street. We didn't care. We did not care, ladies and gentlemen. Some people would not allow us into their restaurant to eat in the 1980s in California because of what we looked like as a family. We went somewhere else. We ate something else. We were happy. We were a family filled with nothing but unconditional love and hope. And Pat and Debbie Hines saved all three of our lives. And they are my mom and dad. But in order for you to understand what led me to that bridge? It was many things. In order for you to fully understand it, you need to know where I came from. Born on 6th Street in a crack motel in the Tenderloin of San Francisco, the worst neighborhood there then, the worst neighborhood there today. Probably a box spring for a mattress over a concrete slab floor. These are the kind of places that mom and dad had to pay by the hour, on the hour, and if they didn't, they were out. And they had to keep a roof over their kid's head, me and my brother. They had to keep a roof over our head, which meant that they had to leave infants unattended to go do score or sell drugs or do whatever they had to do, however illegal, to pay that motel bill on the hour by the hour. Which meant they left two infants alone over a, over a concrete slab floor we could have fallen and cracked our heads open on. They left two kids alone lying next to dangerous drug paraphernalia, sharp metal objects, if we had touched them, they killed us. On 
until one fateful day, one seedy motel clerk made his most unseedy decision, heard me and my brother scream and cries one too many times for his liking. This is the guy who doesn't call the police for all the shady things he's doing. He calls the police, the police come to Child Protective Services, they soup us up, smelling sour and grief. The court documents read, and I quote, the children lie there, barely clothed, not even a dead, screaming and crying not to be neglected. We had distended bellies filled with liquid, bruises from the tops of our sternums to the bottoms of our abdomens from being malnourished. Mom and Dad fed us so they could steal Kool-Aid, Coca-Cola, and sour milk was my first nine-month diet. And, and here's the thing. They took us into protective custody, which meant we were taken from our parents. They took us into protective custody, and they placed us into the system. Who knows what system I speak of? Foster care. If this video helped you, inspired you, or you think you could help someone you know, please take a second to share this video. Your share could save a life. And whatever you do, fight to be well. Be here tomorrow.